And it's, it's wonderful. Isn't it wonderful how the Spirit's unveiling itself? I mean, our yeah. scales are coming off. We're beginning to see. See, mainly, who we are. That's what. Yes. That's what. Yes. And so, I had actually been on this topic, this idea, for a, a few weeks. And it's called the balance of power. And uh, I would just say up front, it's definitely controversial. Uh, not that in the content is, it's in the way that we've been taught to think. And we've all been taught to think in certain veins or ideologies or whatever. And I'm not saying that those are right. I'm not saying they're wrong at all. I'm just simply saying this is something that I think is worthy of looking at, at least giving it at least giving it the attention that there can be something deeper into it. So that's, I'm presenting it to you in that fashion, not to say that this is exactly the way it is, but I am saying that a lot of the things we have been taught for the last, God knows how long, at least yeah. 1,700 years is not the way that it is. And that's sometimes difficult because we get so grounded yeah. in our ideas and what we have been taught to believe. And we all know that's true. So to start out with, let's just go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in your New Testament, which to me is one of the uh, passages of Scripture that is very controversial, and a lot of religious ideas have come from this passage of Scripture. And I mean a lot, uh, more than maybe we would realize up front. But I would just simply say, a lot of our ideology has come out of this particular passage of Scripture. So I want to use this passage of Scripture just kind of as a springboard to look at some things. And uh, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 37. Uh, everybody there? It says, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest, not that body, everybody say body, body. Er, that body which shall be but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body. Everybody say a body. 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 <laughs> okay. God gives it a body as it hath pleased him or God. God gives, in other words, to everything God gives a body. Is that, is that okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about it. To everything God gave a body. If you, look, if you look at the mineral kingdom, God gave the mineral kingdom a body. If you yes. look at the plant kingdom, God gave the plant kingdom a body. Yes. If you look at the, the fowl kingdom, God gave that kingdom a body. If you Amen. look at the fish, etc. I, I'm, being, I'm being repetitive very much on purpose because we have an idea that we read it and we really are ingrained in it. I mean, we really hold on to it. And when you see it, I pray to God that you will see it. Mm -hmm. Then I pray that you quit associating yourself with it. In other words, you do not ever see anybody associate a bird with a tree and say that right. that bird has the nature of that tree. You don't say that because you can't even go there. Your brain won't think that way. You do not ever say that a fish has the nature of a bird. Do you? No, not ever. So listen to this very closely. See, God gives this soul and body that shall be a bare grain, may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as it has pleased him. Now in the kingdoms, Different kingdom, plant kingdom, fowl kingdom, fish kingdom, bird kingdom, etc. In the different kingdoms, every kingdom produces after the kind of its kingdom, and it don't cross. Right. You've never seen a dog cross with a cat. Don't work. The only place that I know that you can kind of cross, but it's not outside its particular kingdom, is you can breed a horse to a jackass and get a mule. But when you get a mule, you cannot breed a mule to a mule and get a mule. That's a dead end. It will not breed. A mule cannot be bred to produce a mule. That's just a, that's a biological fact. 
Okay? You can't, that's the only place I know that anybody's ever tried to cross that. You know, I don't know that anybody's ever tried to cross the fowl and fish kingdom, even though there are fish that fly. You see what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. But I don't know anybody's ever tried to do that. And the reason they didn't, they can't, and they don't, is is a very valid and solid idea. It's, it come, that idea, I think, comes from God. So, God gives it, verse 38, God gives it a body as it has pleased Him. And to ever see His own body. Can't be crossed, okay? You can see that. Now, this word body in the Greek is the word soma. That's that, that word soma in the Greek is used in the Old Testament for the words slaves one time. One time only and one time only in the King James translation in Jeremiah. And when you look at it in King James translation in Jeremiah, you'll notice that it is not a word that's in the original text. It is italicized simply meaning it's been added by the translators. Why? Because there is not a word in Hebrew for slave or slaves. Every one of us have been taught and we actually believe that the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. And it doesn't say that anywhere at all in the Bible. Nowhere will you ever find that because the word slave is not in the Hebrew language. Then we come to the New Testament, and in the New Testament, we only find the word body and slave used interchangeably one time again. This time in the book of Revelations in the 18th chapter, we find the same word for slaves is the same word for body. So my question is this, is your body your slave or is it not? And you don't have to answer that question. I'm just throwing that out there for us to think about. There's another word that's used that comes from this word soma, which is the word for body, and it's the root word sozo. And most of us have heard of that word probably, maybe not really familiar with it that much, but in the Greek New Testament, the word sozo, which is the root word for soma, spelled exactly the same except for Z and M, is the word servant. And it's used that way as servants. But it mainly means like a bond servant or a, a servant, a love servant. Or it means a partner. Not somebody that you usurp authority over. That's how we would think about it because we would think the servant of the house is the slave of the house and I'm in charge of that servant. That's how we would look at it because we've been taught to look at it that way. But the word actually... When you look at the word sozo, it doesn't mean a servant. It doesn't mean a slave. It doesn't even mean a love partner. The word actually means to be whole. With the idea behind it that we're not whole. And that's the whole problem right there. Is the lack of our ability to be whole. And our ability to be whole would be to balance the power that we have. We don't know that simply because we probably have not been told or thought that way in 1700 years at all but to balance the power that we have and we do have power and we don't recognize it we are the actually we are the recipient of the power we have exercised in our life up until this very moment and what's that think is we see that if we want to change something then we will have to balance this power that we have and i and i'm saying that balance because i think you'll be able to see it once I put some things on the board, at least I pray that you'll be able to see it. Then notice it's the next verse, 39. Instead of using the word body, and we would do this and we would interchange it, it says what? All flesh. Now it uses another word, flesh. And so this word flesh actually is the Greek word sarx. Sarx. And the word actually, is, it just simply means human nature human nature and it has the idea of just a human not the nature of a of a fish or a bird or a plant but the nature of a human and God, God's like sort of like God created everything there's no no question about that I think everybody would say God God has created all that means everything 
and has deposited itself in some fashions in all. That, again, means everything. I believe most everybody would agree with that. But for some reason, the human is different. They have been, they have kind of been designated differently than any of the rest of all of God's creation. There's not anything in God's creation other than a human being that can balance your checkbook. <laughs> Many human beings aren't good at that. But we, we are the only one in creation that can do that. In other words, we are the only one in creation that has a level of intelligence that is on a very extreme high scale. And I'll put it this way. It's actually on the scale of God, but not used that way. And it should be because we have within our very being this thing called divine nature. We have it. We're the only thing it does. Even though everything that exists lives by the life of God that's deposited in it. But for some reason, we are different. We are unique. We are, I guess you could say we're special. <laughs> and, we, and we really, really are. So when we see this word flesh, it actually comes from the Greek word sars, which just simply means human nature. All right, then let's go. If you will go with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And I want you to see something. And I'm going to kind of throw something out at you. Just to see if you can entertain the thought of this. And from here, we're going to really get into some stuff that would really uh, tweak your ideas. Okay, you find Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. Come on in, you guys. We'll just give y'all a chance to get in here. We'll just actually get you started. Y'all can find your seat, whichever, wherever, and uh, we'll just keep right on going. So. Genesis chapter 1. And uh, you have your mind. No, I don't. No, you don't. Let's see. We used to have some right here. Right yeah, because you'll want to see this. I know Phil's got his and his. Uh, yeah. You want to see this? Okay, we've been talking about the body, the human body, and we've been talking about the flesh. That's kind of what we we use First Corinthians 15 to kind of introduce this idea that the body is a servant, but in a better picture because if we use the word servant we think of the idea that somebody that works for me or somebody that is my slave and my servant etc. Actually the idea is that they're a servant is a partner. Almost like a husband and a wife. It's kind of the idea behind it. Husband and wives are not are partners. One's not over the other. I mean, you know what religion is give us that idea. You know, he's over her or she's over him. And you know, did y'all know that in you probably didn't know this, maybe you did know this, that in the the, in, the sack, the womb of of a, of a woman, a mother, the fluid that's in there, the, the mass majority of that fluid is testosterone. I'm sure you probably didn't know that. Whether it's a woman or a man, the mass majority of that fluid is testosterone. And that testosterone will produce the, a, big, a big part of that of that child in the room in the womb and one of the first things it does it begins the testosterone is one of the things that builds the brain right off the bat and in every you and you'll see this very common this is a very common thing then in just all men the ring finger is always longer than the index finger that's just what it is and it's rare in women but in women who have a longer ring finger than to have an index finger is because they receive more testosterone and generally they will be kind of alpha. Or you can call it male dog. Mm -hmm. That's just a common fact. But we don't know it because we haven't really opened our eyes to realize this book is a book about the biology of the physical body and everybody's comparing the fingers. <laughs> yeah, You're going to find if you have a... <laughs> Uh, alpha dominant personality, but anyway, that's that's that is the main ingredient. It's a very important ingredient in the building of the brain. If you notice, the brain is a very the brain and its stem, the spinal column, is the very first thing, and that's what looks like the serpent. 
that's ready to strike. That's the uh, idea behind that. And the very key thing that's in that serpent that's about ready to strike, or the brain and the spinal column, is, it is the pineal gland. And the pineal gland is that single eye that's right in the very core, right in the very center of that brain. And as the center of that brain, the pineal gland is that which balances the power of that brain. Because that brain is both masculine and feminine in everything created. Amen. And we don't realize that. So there's not a woman that's not masculine and feminine. There's not a man that's not masculine and feminine. That's a simple fact, but we, we don't know how to balance that power. But nevertheless, we have that power, and that power is, is just shown over and over and over throughout Scriptures in so many different ways. Okay? So again, holding on to that, and I'll show you what we're going to do is we're going to try to see there's just so much that I'd like to say in just a short period of time, so I'm trying to keep my thoughts from just getting all crazy and going every direction. The things that we have to see is how God has created everything to balance the power of spirit and matter, or in other words, God and its bodies, etc., etc., because both those are empowered. And, and and, and they are. And we, as we see that, we'll begin to recognize it. So that's how we started out there in 1 Corinthians 15 to, to look at the, the body and the flesh. And now I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 11. Now I want you to read this. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Everybody say, after his kind. After his this kind. word kind, uh, uh, I'm going to have to go ahead and put this word up here in Hebrew. This word kind in Hebrew is spelled with a, and you'll see this because this is going to be the most important glyph right here that I talk about today. That glyph is going to be the most important glyph I talk about. And that glyph is called the mem, and it has a 40 value. And in Hebrew, in Hebrew, there are three mothers, three mothers, and the three mothers are the building blocks of everything in the Hebrew alphabet. And those three mothers are number one, the alif. That's number one. The mem, that's number 40. And the sheen, that's number 300. Now that's the building block for every kind that there is. Okay? I don't care what it is. For every kind, that's the building block. So those are the three, and I'll show you how they work here in just a minute. But this particular word that we just read right here, kind, it's the mem, uh, the yod. The yod is 10. And because the yod, there are two, two glyphs in, in Hebrew. The olive, which is one, that's the source. The olive. And then the 10, which is the, which is the, this is the phallic and the yoni. This is the male and the female. God is androgynous. But we don't, we don't understand that we don't, because we've been all taught that God is an old gray-headed man. Yeah. God's not an old gray-headed man. God is all androgynous. God is both mother and father. And he blends those powers together to make manifestation, or in other words, so that it can show itself to itself. And so that's what this whip represents. And all of this comes out of this mem. This is important. We will look at that. And then the last one is the final non, and it has a 700 value, which it means that it is perfection and completion. And it's, it uses, especially we'll use that number seven this morning quite a bit. So that's the word kind, K-I-N-D. Notice again, verse 11, and it says very clearly, let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding seed, fruit trees yielding the fruit, See, after its kind, or after his kind. Look at verse 12. 
And the earth brought forth grass yielding, uh, herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed and was in itself after his kind. And God said, this is, this is a good thing. Okay? Now look at verse 21. Same chapter, verse 21. And God created whales and ever living creature that moveth, which which the waters, which the waters, everybody say that, which the waters, waters, which the waters, because you see everything on this earth, everything in this manifest world comes from water. Everything. Everything. If it lives and moves and has been, it's water. It's mainly water. For instance, you and me are 80% water. Yeah. And many times we, we can say that just in passing, we talk about that and we say that. However, if we take that and we drink that, especially if we have, if we have read Emoto's book, The Message in Water, or if we re read his book, The True Power of Water, or uh, some of his other books about water, you know what we do with our water? Well, some people do it. Same thing Annie and I have done with those Crown Royal bottles in there that we drank our water out of. We write on those. You know why? Because we, we realize that, or we have learned through just reading, we have learned that somehow or another water takes the imprint of the word. It must, doesn't necessarily read the word. It reads the intent of that word, and then the water responds to that. So if you say harsh things around water, water responds to you. And we didn't realize this and didn't know it. I didn't know that. And just until recently, it hit me like a, like we call it this phrase, it hit me like a ton of brick. That water is intelligent. That water actually can read you and me. Water can read you. If you walk up to a river, or a lake, or a pond, that water knows you before you even recognize that water, and we don't even recognize that the water is that intelligent. But if you think about that, you're 80, some say 95%, but at least 80% water. Your vessel is, in, is influenced by the sun and the moon, whether you realize it or recognize it, just like the sun and the moon infects anything on the earth that affects anything on the earth that's water. So just like we write on these bottles, love, peace, joy, what about our physical body? What do we do with our physical body? Is our physical body reading the words that we say? And if we say angry words or harsh words, does our body read that and, and respond to it? Yes. It sure does. More than we realize and a lot more than we recognize because water is intelligent. As a matter of fact, water is God materialized. Mm -hmm. It is the most important ingredient that you're going, and everything throughout this book you're going to see is centered around water. Characters that are used, they're centered around water. Events that are that happen are centered around water. And many times we just haven't paid attention or just didn't notice that. So, look at verse 21. God created the great whales and every living creature that moves which the waters brought forth. The waters brought forth. And it brought it forth in abundantly after their kind. So therefore, plants brought forth plants after their kind. And you can't cross that. Fish and fowl brought forth after their kind. And you can't cross that. Now listen to this. Animals and humans brought forth after their kind. And you cannot cross that. But we do. Every one of us, I read some of my most favorite authors, they'll start talking about our animal nature. How can I have an animal nature? Kind does not cross, not kind. Period. I, there's nothing about me that's like an animal. And then we say, oh, Brother Lynn, sometimes you act like an animal. No, sometimes an animal acts like a bird. Baby, y'all, I grew up in a farm. We had chickens and we had roosters. And I'm telling you, some of those roosters, some roosters are mean. Some roosters have big claws. And I've seen two roosters go after each other. And I'm telling you, sometimes it's a fight to death. And it's ugly. It's gory. It's as ugly as any dog fighting a dog or any man fighting a man. But nobody crossed their kind. Now, if I'm acting like anything, I'm acting like a human that don't know who I am. But not an animal. Because I'm not an animal. You're not an animal. You haven't crossed the kind. Like I said, there is nowhere you will ever find 
that anything crossed its kind so that it acts like something. It may act like something else. A human may act like a, a dog. A dog may act like a bird. A bird may act like a fish. And I tell you, in every one of the kingdom, you'll seem to see violence. Why would that be? Because it's the lower nature of water. Water always seeks its lowest point. And so if I am 80% water, water is always seeking to pull me down unless I know how to draw on my higher nature and pull it up to its potential. And that's totally my choice. It's something that I, that I do or don't do. Either way, I can do it or I cannot do it. So look at verse uh, 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures after its kind. Cattle, creeping things, beasts, and the earth after its kind, and it was so, and God created the beast of the earth after its kind, and cattle after their kind, everything that creeps on the earth after its kind, God said it, God saw it, and said it's good, and God said, let us make man. Now we create something different. And man is created only after God's kind. That's all. That's why Paul, uh, Peter said this. He said, he said that you have a divine nature. No, we don't ever talk about our divine nature. <laughs> we we'll talk about the other nature, but not, but not our divine nature. But we do have a divine nature, and it's tapping into that divine nature to where we will see the true nature of the, of the creature that God created us to be. Okay, let me, let me get you to go with me to the book. We're going to come back to Genesis 1 and 2. A lot and work with this passage a whole lot. But look, go with me real quickly to the book of Exodus. Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 25. Chapter 25, Exodus chapter 25, we're going to look at a verse here, verse 40. Found that? It says, and look that you make, you make them after their pattern. See that word pattern? After yeah. their pattern. This word pattern, I'm going to put it up here on the board so that you can see this word pattern. It is... The tov, which has a 400 value. It is the beth, or veth, which is number two. It is the non, which has a 50 value. Well, let me go ahead and put the value of these up here to 400, because I want you to see that. And then it has the yud, which has the value of 10, or in other words, again, you see the male-female comparison. And then it has this tov again at the end, 400 value. So when I do gematra and I add these up, I got 400 and 400 is 800, right? Yeah. 810, 860, 862, is that right? Yeah. 862, which if I total that up, I have 8, 9, 10, that's 16, right? Mm -hmm. And if I total that up, I have what? 7. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Okay, that brings me to this. And this is a very familiar character with you guys. And this is shown throughout Scripture in so many different ways. We call this the stick man. Right? That's how, because of the seven yawns or facets of life in Genesis 1 and 2. And it's also, we draw also from this, this uh, symbol, all of these symbols cross over and all of these symbols uh, are important. Okay? The circle with the cross in the middle of it. That's a very, very ancient symbol and it way predates Christianity. Okay? And so in this symbol, we have the signs, the 12 signs of the zodiac but I want, to, I want you to see something right here. I'll just do this. This is a sign of Aries. 
which is always the head. And this is the sign of Libra, L and B, Libra, which is always the pelvic. Now, so from the head, from the head to the pelvic, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have seven signs. These are the most important. This is the torso. This is the this is where the brain and the spinal column are housed. This is where they're at. Y'all follow this? Y'all follow this pattern right here? So that's that symbol, the sign of the cross and the circle, the astrological wheel, it, the importance of it is the seven. The importance of the word pattern is the number seven. That, that particular word. That's the importance of that pattern. And God said, I want you to build. You remember what they were building? You remember what he said, told them to build? He said, now let, let's say this again. I want you to look at this. And God looked, verse 40, and God, and, and look that you make after the pattern which was shown you where? In the mountain. In, it's shown you in the mountain. And this particular word Mountain, let's see if I even wrote that word down here. This particular word mountain is this word right here. And that's how you and I would say it. We would call it mountain. And that's how we would say it. We would say, well, where was Moses at? Was it he was up on the mountain? But yet if you read the story, you'll say that the you'll see that the mountain that he was on was a desert. And that really or the mountain that he was on was a plain. Plain flat place. So we get confused many times that. But you take this, this is the word for mount or mountain, and it's the word har. Hay, which has a five value, and rash, which has a 200 value. So if you add them up, what do you get? 205? Yep. Is that right? If you add them up, what do you get? So what is the mountain the pattern on? The mountain is the pattern of the physical body. Now, this, this kind of scenario can be played out all through Scripture. And because of Gematria, because of the way the Hebrew code is, is compiled, the way it's put together, I mean, it's just in stone. You can't, you can't make it up. It's just too, it's too rich, it's too big to be made up. It cannot be made up. So you have to realize that the pattern, that the mountain is talking about you. It's talking about me. And so when we begin to see, as we begin to see that, then oh my goodness, it begins to change everything for us. Now go with me to another passage of scripture in Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to do a whole lot of digging in Genesis chapter 2 late or later on or maybe this afternoon. To see this, this passage of scripture, it has been so corrupted and so manipulated that we read it and we read into it not even realizing we read into it. I'll show sure you exactly what I mean when I say that. It says in verse 22, it says in the real, real, everybody, you see that? Is everybody at that place? Can you see that real? The real is the, is the actually it's the Hebrew word Tesla. Sort of like the name Tesla. And actually, here's what the word means. The word real means this. Say. Now, does it make sense to you? And this is a story you've all been told. Everyone's been told this. That God took a real out of Adam. Is that what y'all told? Yeah. And so, therefore, that must leave Adam one real short of a woman. Is that right? That's not true. <laughs> Men and women have exactly the same amount of ribs. It's a simple fact. So then what happens in the story? Well, now, if I were to say that God took a sail and began to build you from a sail, you don't have any problem with that now because of biology. You can see that because it is a sail that builds your body. If you want to take a sail and build a leaf, you don't have any problem with that because it is the sail that builds the leaf. Or you want to build a fish, you, the first thing you do it is a sail that built because the sail is the first building block to build in the physical world. Now the thing about this, the thing about the sail is the sail is made up. 
get this. This is, <laughs> you, like I said, you can't make this stuff up. It's just the sale is made up of three mothers. Really? Yeah. Here's what a sale looks like if you really put it, and, and it has a membrane. Yeah. And then inside that membrane, it has an electron, it has a proton, and it has a neutron. And that's it. It's a trinity. It's built up of a trinity. That's what a cell. And, and the biggest part of a cell is the empty space inside the membrane. I mean, it's like 98, 99%. And do you realize at night, if you look up into the sky at night and all you see are those beautiful dotted stars, the biggest part of what you see is the black space that holds those stars. And that black space takes up over 99% of all that there is out there. And it's that space that we don't know anything about. And it is that space that is God. And it is God that is the dark light that reflects itself off all of those things out there that you see as stars. They're just reflections yes. of really that black. Yeah. Mm. That darkness. Yeah. And that's what makes you. So this, this story is correct. But it's not correct if you look at it that God created this man all of a sudden. And now then he said, well, <laughs> He needs somebody to play with. He needs a partner. He needs somebody to a helpmate. And so I'm gonna put him to sleep. I'm gonna put him under, put him under, and I'm gonna put him to sleep. And when I got him to sleep, I'm gonna jerk one of his ribs out. Now, why would he want to build a woman from a man's rib? Proportionally, it's wrong. I mean, it'd be too big. So, so see the whole story. And look at this. Look, watch this story, and see how we do this story. It said. Verse 22, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, do you realize when it says man there, we automatically say Adam? Automatically. It doesn't say that in Hebrew, but that's what we automatically, you know what it says in, in Hebrew? The word for Adam is, uh, is in the Hebrew, is Adam. Alif, Dalit, Mim. But this word is Iash. Now, can you hear any similarity between Adam in Hebrew and Eish in Hebrew? No, they're not similar. And so therefore, they don't even have, they're not even the same ballpark as to what they mean. And so this doesn't say that God took a rib out of Adam. It says that God took a cell from Eish. Do you know what the root word for Eish is? The root word for Eish is Esh. Do you know what the word ash is? It's the word for the sun or for fire or for light. So what is God doing? God is taking from this vast, we can call that darkness ether. Sometimes we do in some of the uh, uh, Sanskrit usage yeah. of the term, we call it ether. Here's another term that we can use and we call it that. And, and it, it will fit, we call it akasha. Have you ever heard of the Akasha, the Akasha records? Have you ever yeah. heard of that? Some people have, some people haven't. It's a Sanskrit word, and it actually has to do with the ether, but it has more to do with the memory of ether. So the Akasha actually is something that is it's undefinable, it's unlimited, it's not, it's just not totally really understood, can't be understood. It's just like saying God. We don't know what that means. We don't know what that is if we get honest. Yeah. If we reduce God from being this old gray-headed man and we say that term and we realize, wait, God's the ether. No, God's the space. No, God's the glorious darkness. No, God's the light. No, God is love. Yes, God is all of that and more. God is everything. Roll up into, into you and me as one thing. Yeah. What it sounds like is he's taking it from the before. Like, well, see, in, in space, there is no before, there is no after, there is no beginning, and there is no end. Yeah. See, that's the problem with eternity and mm -hmm. temporality. In temporality, we want to start, start, begin, and we want to end. end. It doesn't happen that way. And actually, we're not that way. We're, just, we're, we're here under a temporary fix, under a, a temporary uh, idea program. Well, it, it sounds like what I'm not before but the forever yeah because the the ether is forever there, as a matter of fact even science today quantum science today says they used to say that there was an end to space they used to say that say that it imploded and it exploded and somewhere out there in the explosion is an end 
And then when it reaches that, it implodes and comes back in on itself. They have come to find out that is not true. There is no end. Period. There's no word that, it, that it's not. It just it just is not. Okay? That's that's difficult. So let's let's come back to this. I, I want you to see what this is saying because it is so beautiful and it's so important because we have to change our paradigm. If we do not, if we're in a paradigm shift. Did y'all notice that? We moved into the Aquarian age. You know yes. what the Aquarian age is? Yes. We are in the age of the water bearer. Do you yes. know who the water bearers are? We are the water bearers. We have always been. We yes. have the imprint. Yes. We have the message that's imprinted in us and don't know how to pull it out and extract it. That's what we have to learn. That's what we are, that's what we're really working at, trying to trying to find out who am I really? What is what is my makeup? What is my purpose? What is my design? This beautiful book has always been filled with it. We just it's just been so clouded over. Clouded over. So notice what it says, and I want to read things into it that you think, but that are not there. Verse 22. And the sail which the Lord God had taken from Esh. In other words, God took this from light. Yes. Uh, let me take your little stick man right here. Yes. And I want to do this to the stick man, okay? And then I want to do this. I want to put this trinity up here because this trinity, the three mothers in the Hebrew, this trinity is in the Kabbalah. And this trinity, we can call it God, if you would like. I mean, that's, that's the best. But it's the main thing about this is light. And what light produces is life. And what life produces is love. And outside of that, that is God. That is what God is. That is what God will always be. He can never change that. God is light, life, and love. And so out of this light, life, and love, God deposited through the sperm of your father. And isn't it amazing that in the sperm, that sperm was made up of a trinity, a sail. And in that trinity, it had an electron, which is light. It had a neutron, which is life. And it had a proton, which is love. Isn't that amazing? And that went into matter, mother, same word. <laughs> Actually, it's exactly the same word in, in Hebrew or in Greek or in Latin. It's the same. Matter and mother is the same word. Marine, the marine. So it all builds. It's all coming out of this idea of water. And so God comes out of this trinity of light, life, and love, deposits itself through that sperm into your father's seed as, as light, life, and love. And that seed is deposited in, in its mass. That seed is masculine, but its whole projection is matter. In other words, if that seed cannot penetrate that matter egg, then there is no visible, physical, material manifestation of God in, in any sphere period whatsoever. So that that penetration is as much God as it is the material that it penetrates. There's no separation. So, so I'm saying this, I'm saying your nature is as much and more God than it is material matter which you manifest. Can you see that? Yeah. You can just kind of chew on that just a little bit and notice what it says right here. So this is what he's saying. He, he, when he, but they use the word man. May he woman. So this word man would be on, on this would be E-S-H. I'll spell it for you in Hebrew. E-E-Y-S-H. -E -E E-S-H. That's how he would spell it in Hebrew. E-S-H. May he woman. Now you, you read that. I read that. I used to read that and just automatically say Eve. I just automatically said Eve, woman. Who was the one? She was Eve. So there's the Adam and Eve. That's them in the garden. But it doesn't ever say that. Matter of fact, Eve is used twice in the Old Testament Scripture. Now you think, wait a minute. Eve is an important character. Y'all heard so much about Eve. She's only used two times in the Old Testament Scripture. And it's right here in the third chapter and the fourth chapter. And that's it. She's not used at all the rest of the whole Bible. Two times. In the New Testament, she's only used two times. And yet we have, we have hung on Eve 
the downfall of everything that is. She's, yeah. she's probably as important figure, if not more important figure, in our ideology than anything that there is. And that's not true. It doesn't, it doesn't show that to be this way. And it says now this, this particular, he took that life, life of love, he deposited it in the ash, which was the sea, and he deposited that into the woman, which was E-S-H-A. E-E-S-H-A. H. H -R. This is male and this is female. Now, this, this just really gets beautiful, so just hold on. So, out of this trinity, I have to do this. Everybody, everybody stick with me here in the boat. This is what we call, this is called in ancient Hebrew, this is called the Kabbalistic tree of life. Everybody's familiar with that term, tree of life. Aren't we? Y'all familiar with that term, tree of life? And these are the ten sephirots. The ten sephirots in the Kabbalistic tree of life are the ten emanations of the sound of spirit in Genesis 1. And I, and I want you to hear what I said. The sound of spirit, not the words of spirit. Spirit makes sounds. That's what the word actually says and then and there are only three sounds you can make without your vocal cords. That one of them is ah uh, you don't need a vocal cord to do it. The other one mmm nasal. And the other one is uh, lips. You can make all those all those sounds and those are very sacred sounds. In every culture those are sacred sounds. Matter of fact in some cultures in meditation, you take those three sounds and you just sound it over and over and over. Those were the three sounds that sounded in Genesis 1. The ten sephirots, which were sounds, and actually the word just simply means emanation. Mm -hmm. It was energy. It was creativity. It was everything God is coming forth. Hallelujah. And we, we were... Kabbalah, the word Kabbalah actually means to receive. We were that which were receiving that sound. Oh, God. Hey, take that in. Drink that. You know, that's, that's who we are. And it all comes out of this, the sale. It all comes out of the three mothers. First building block in anything in a material manifest world. You know, if they're looking for life on another planet, do you know the first thing they look for? What is it? Water. Exactly. If they if there ain't no water there, you know what they do? Ain't no life there. There has to be water there. If there's water there, there is life there. Yeah. And that's the first place they look. Is, that's it. That's where the water's look at. They're looking for water. Now watch this. Watch this very closely because this is not Adam and Eve. This is not a man and woman. This is not where they stand before God and God performs a marriage ceremony and says, okay, now I'm going to pronounce y'all husband and wife and ain't nothing from here going to tear you apart or pull you asunder. That is not what this is saying. It ain't got nothing to do with Adam and Eve. It has everything to do with Ash, e -ash and e -ash -a. It has everything to do with the light and the life that that light produces. And that happens to be you and me. So again, let's look at this verse of Scripture again. Verse 22, And the sail, or rib, which the Lord God had taken from Eash, made he Easha, and brought her unto him. Now, this is a gross translation, but nevertheless, we just have to work with it. And I'll, I'll try to interpret some of it in the proper Hebrew rather than as it is in English. It says, And Adam said, this, now this word Adam is actually alif dalit mim, which is the word for human human flesh, male or female, it doesn't matter. So this actually is referring to the four uh, gases that build anything in this particular, in this particular carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, or yod hey vav hey, or or fire, earth, air, and water. Those are major ingredients that build us, along with a lot of different ingredients. So. So these ingredients is what he's talking about. Verse 23, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called Eesha, because she is taken out of Eesh. Therefore shall Eesh 
leave his father. That word father in Hebrew is actually ab, which actually means the number one source. It's referring to that. Why? Because he's come from that. Now he's, he's, it's like he's separated from it, but he's not. And I realize the reason he is is because he's lost his memory. He, he forgot who he was. And what do you? What are one of the, one of the main things that we're here for? I'm not. I'm not teaching you anything. I'm showing you how to remember what you already know. You already know this if you listen real closely. And you say, yeah. Man, I know that. That just bears witness. I know that. Yeah, you already know this. I can't teach you or show you anything. You can either bear witness to it or not. And it's no problem. I always say if you don't bear witness to it, put it on the shelf. You may later. Yeah. And so that's what this is talking about. His father and his, his father and his mother. So therefore, you come from this mother's, from the, the, the source of the one. And shall cleave unto his Esha, Esha, and they shall be one. See what that says? One flesh. That's not a good term because it's not referring to flesh. It actually is saying they shall be one body. Now remember, again, one body. Now remember, I'm. I'm I want to bring this back to your memories. What we looked at in Exodus chapter 25 is that God, always show, God said, I want to show you the pattern. That's, how, that's what all of this is about. It's about a blueprint. It's about a design. It's about a pattern. And that pattern is the pattern of you. And this is woven throughout Scripture, in, out, everywhere. It's just woven over and over this pattern, this, this whole ideology. And it says, notice what it says. You shall be, you see that word, one? That's the word ikad. Can y'all say that? Say ikad. Ikad. And actually the word ikad means to be together or to be one. Now you remember at the very beginning I told you that the word sarx, which was the word translated for flesh, I told you the root of that word was soma, yeah. which the word soma means to be whole. And the word be whole means to be one. And you see, we have not really been whole. We've been a divided house, divided against herself. Don't realize the battle that I have is with myself and think it's with somebody else. Thinking I'm struggling or I'm in war or I'm in this and that and the other with somebody or something or this and that and the other. Not even realizing that the battle, or there's really not a battle, the real grappling is with me. It's me. I have to work out my own side. I have to work out... Everything I'm telling you in ancient material was called the great work or the great path or the single path. It's that which in any indigenous culture today, everyone, whether they are male or female, has to go into initiation. And what in the world is initiation? Initiation is being baptized into who you really are. It's becoming, initiation is becoming one with who you are. Like in boys, it started at puberty, usually around the age of 12, and girls the same way when they begin to have their period. Either way, you start into initiation, and that initiation is not something that you go through. It's not a course that you take. It's not a six-month or a year or two-year thing and say, oh, hallelujah, I got initiated, now I'm in. No, initiation begins, and it, it, it never ends. Initiation is a continual process of needing yourself, of finding yourself, of being, being yourself, being who you have always been designed and been built to be. And that would be one, one flesh or one body. So I want to read you a note that I wrote back. Uh, I wrote this back in the first of uh, December. Actually, I wrote this on December the 12th. We are all born with a downward pull. And when I say that, what I'm referring to is the fact that we are a vessel of water. Mem, yeah. 40. That we are all born as that. And that, and that water, that water pulls at you. Have, have you ever had a negative day? Have you ever had a, a yeah. day of depression come? Oh, God. Or yeah. are these bad, this thought comes. I, I know y'all never, I have. <laughs> Sometimes I've, I've had some of them, they seem to come in bunches. 
So we are all born with this downward pull. Something seems to pull or tug, or we use this word tempt or lure. <laughs> have y'all ever have y'all ever noticed that it seems to draw me? Have you ever had some just try to pull me into it? That's normal and natural, okay? Flip Wilson used to say it this way. Y'all remember Flip Wilson, right? Thank <laughs> God kids today don't realize Flip Wilson. He was a tremendous uh, entertainer. But Flip Wilson, what how would he say? He said it was that little devil on my shoulder. And then they would show that little Maybe. black they show that little black demon over here and this little white one over here on this one yeah. was whispering in this ear, one was whispering. He said it's that little you know, that's kind of a cute analogy, but actually it's the water of who you are. There, it's, that, it's the nature of being human. It's not the little demon on your shoulder. That's not what it is. Now, you know, we've had a daycare at the church there in Dalton for close to 30 years. And we had over 100 students, quite a number of years, running. And so in the close to 30 years, we have had come through our daycare somewhere to the tune of over 30,000 children that we have been able to touch in different ways. And, and we literally have. You know, used to we got involved in the county with the, uh, the different daycare associations. And so, God, for like five, six, seven years in a row, we were nominated as the number one daycare in the county. Our kids at age four were ready for school, ready for first and some second grade when they come out of our four-year daycare. I mean, you know, we really worked at it. And so back then, every year, I would do a graduation to those kids that were the fourth ready, getting ready to go into kindergarten in school. And we did our graduation thing and everything. So we have, in that week, and so I have by, by that being there, in and out of there all the time, all 10 of my grandkids coming through that daycare, and therefore all of my 10 grandkids, when I come in, hey, Papa! And so I am still Papa to this day. Even though I haven't had a grandchild there in God 15 years or longer, but to this very day, I'm still Papa. I go back there, and they, everyone, they say, oh, Papa, come here, Papa, give me five of them. Still, it's that same way. But let me say this. We have what we call a two-year-old class, and, and they always call it. We never try to call it that. I always call it terrific twos. They always call it another word. Y'all remember what they call the twos? Terrible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Commonly, they call it terrible twos. Why? They said, them little boys are so filled with mischief. I mean, it's, you say, my God, are they born that way? They are. <laughs> they really are. But do you know what? And I said, it just ain't them little boys. Y'all just ain't been around enough them little girls. Them little girls is the same identical way. They just sometimes a little more subtle. But they said, oh, no, they're sugar and spice and everything. Nice. Right? Now, if they're their year own, and that's a whole different story. It don't matter if male or female. If they're your own little grandbabies, they are all sugar and spice and everything. Mm -hmm. You can't get enough yeah. of them. Is that not true? <laughs> you know it's true. But there's just something in them that's inquisitive. Now, we always call them terrific too. That's what we try to get the teachers and everybody to do. And then behind their back, they say, oh, they're the terrible twos. And the little boys are real mischievous. And they're really not. They're very inquisitive. And they're very inquisitive on purpose. It's simply because this water is seeking the information that it already knows. It's just looking for confirmation of it. And it does that the rest of your life. It just, it just, that's not abnormal. That's very normal. And that continually happens in all of us. It continually unfolds until we come to a place in our life that we want to uh, get out of that or we want to break free from that. And that's, that's basically, I think, where most of us are at. So I wrote this note that we are all born with a downward pull, and that's, of course, because of the water. Something seems to tug at us, to pull at us, to tempt us, or to lure us, or to try to draw us. Why do children always seem to get into trouble, especially the little boys? Did God create us to be mischief, or did our original parents fall? Now, I'm getting into religion now. Did our original parents fall in paradise and drag us down into that. 
That's what we've been taught to believe. And that's exactly what we believe from this story right here. When in this story, it makes it very clear that as we begin to do certain things, that, and I'll read it to you, it says, you shall, uh, God doth know that in the day that you partake, that in the day that you eat, now I want you to hear what it's saying. Here's what it's saying. In, in the day that you start to eat, now listen to this. Look at this. You see what this is? This is called the Hebrew Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Look at this. Y'all pay attention to this. There's your three. Light, life, and love. How many is left here? Count them up. Seven. Seven. Same as you have right here in the astrological wisdom. Seven. Same as you have over here in the stick man. Seven. Same as you have here in the pattern on the mountain. Seven. The mountain. Seven. Well, is there something about that? Yeah, something about that is you. You and I are the physical, visible manifestation of this seven. That's the perfection. That's the completion. That's who you are. However, here's something about you. You have within your vessel, you have three columns. You have three columns within your being. And it's the same over here. I'm going to do it this way. Right down the middle of the stick man. And I'm going to do it this way from his male side down here and from his female side. You still have three columns. Just split right down the middle. You have your right. You have your right. Okay, I'm going to put it on the board right. And you have your left. You have your male. You have your female. And you do. You do. How many of you know that if you follow the the uh, the serpent on the caduceus, the serpent starts over here on this side, your female side, and you ever notice? And they say this that doesn't your left hemisphere of your brain control your right hemisphere of your brain, and vice versa. It does, and, and that's that's exactly how it's made. It's made to do that. It's made to. That's how it's made. It's made to swirl or to come together or to control that. So, did our original parents here in this garden fall and make a mistake when they said, you will know that in the day that you eat, what were you going to eat? You were not only going to eat the life of the tree of life, you are supposed to eat something else. What else was you going to eat? The fruit. The fruit of it. What was the fruit? The fruit was knowledge. The fruit was knowledge. Mm. Okay. That's the fruit of the tree. Knowledge. Uh, that's important. So, and notice what it says. You shall eat thereof. Then, then what happens when you eat from the fruit of knowledge? Here's what he says. Your eyes will be opened. And that's true. That's just like this morning. If I'm, if I'm presenting this, I pray to God that I am so much and I'm going, my mind going so many directions. That I'm presenting in a way that you would say, wow, I see that. What does that mean? That means that your eye, now I'm not trying to open up these two eyes. Yeah. What eye am I wanting to open up? This. The I want to open up this eye. Yes. This eye. Yes. That single eye. I want to open up that pineal eye because that pineal eye is called the eye of God. Now in the Kabbalistic tree, you have exactly the same thing. You have the male and you have the female. But you have something that's in this tree that's not Kabbalistic tree that's in this tree that in most cases is not drawn on the tree and it's right here in the center. And it's called De'at. And it actually is knowledge and it actually is referring to your pineal gland. The eye that sees. What does it see? It doesn't see through what these dualistic eyes see. These dualistic yes, eyes see. are reduced to the physical manifest world. What does this eye in the middle see? It sees through the eye of God, through the eye of the Spirit. It sees beyond that person that you judge or condemn or talk about or, or, or whatever. It says and your eyes will be open and guess what you'll be like? You'll be as God. Wow. 
Wow, wait a minute now. Let me read you a passage right here. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Why? So that they can be humans with animal nature? No. So they can be like us. So they will be like us. Act like us. Talk like us. Be us in a material manifest world. But what have we done? We have had religion get us off track, get us with this idea that we hold on to. Well, somehow or another, our parents failed. Adam and Eve drug us all into this soup of confusion, not realizing that this soup of confusion is actually called Mim 40. And so I'm just going to disconnect here, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'll, connect, I'll disconnect here and I will pick up here and I want to show you how that God in Scripture has done this, has brought the two to be one. That's what it said right here in Genesis. We just read it. Genesis 2 and verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall, be, and shall cleave unto his wife. Right here it is. This is the Male and the female, these are that you're it's the marrying of your two brains. Yes. Do you realize that most women who have a long ring finger are male dominant? Because of the estrogen that was in the womb. And that's not wrong. That's that's how we're all created. It's like when we learn ourselves off the astrological wheel, we realize that's not anything wrong. We may have a misappropriation of our power. And we do because why? We haven't learned to balance the power of what we are. You see, there's a power of the male. There is a power of the female. And what, are, what is our work in life? Our work in life is to make the two one. That's what it tells you right here in this passage. Shall leave his wife and they shall be one body. Not flesh, one body. There's not any way you can stand a man or woman in front of a preacher, tell them to repeat after me, say this, and say, now you're one body. They will shake their head at that. There ain't no way. They're not one body. He's her, his body, she's her body. But when we realize the truth behind this, God's saying you're a divided house. As long as you stay a divided house, you're constantly in war with yourself. And that's the very one that we want to quit battling with. We want to bring ourselves into that place of wholeness and see through... The single eye, which is the balance of power, will bring it together, bring the power of the spirit and the power of the matter to one central place. That's the path. Walk in that path. Will we have an opportunity to stray to the right or to the left? Absolutely. And sometimes there's nothing in the world. Sometimes that's for, that's for greater enhancement. It's just like walking in a path in a mountain and you see a beautiful water stream or a flower or a plant over here on the right and you veer off to that. You know what they call that in the Old Testament? Transgression. Oh my God, you have got over there in transgression. You're looking at that beautiful waterfall. You're looking at that beautiful plant. You're going to go to hell. <laughs> no, that's a part of the experience of your journey. What you do is you, you admire it. You look at it. It is what it is. And you come right back to the center path to balance the power. Come back to that place where, the, where you are in the center, the core of your being, the heart of your being, yes. and walk from there, live from there. Hallelujah. And that, that will bring peace, joy, happiness, and all of those wonderful things that we all long for and seek to be because it settles the tension in the house of the two. The male female. Okay. Uh, I'll just I'll just unhook right there.